for going here Monday night football. Um, but before we get started, I would um, like to ask the chair to make any comments. And after that, we'll uh, get ourselves in. <laughs> But through certain circumstances and events, 
got out of control. The backdrop to our story is what happens or how the state handles themselves when an event that they sponsor goes bad. So our story, in essence, could become your story to some degree. So suppose that there is another fire, or suppose there is a, another boulder that rolls down a mountain and crashes into a bus. Then, and you are involved in that, then your story will become close to our story. So that is part of the reason why we'd like to address you this evening. So, how does, what happens? The state um, started this event, the state-sponsored event. The fire became out of control. What did it result in for us? It resulted in basically a mess. We have destroyed homes. Almost all of them were 100% destroyed. We have scorched property and we have loss of loved ones. Now, both of my, Sherry stated earlier, both my parents were killed in the fire. But one thing my mom did teach me as I was growing up was to clean up my toys after I was done. To make sure all those little matchbox cars weren't laying around the floor so that when you walked across the floor, you wouldn't step on them. But to make sure the room was restored back to its original condition. Creating a path for my dad or her to walk through was unacceptable. Everything had to be returned. As a parent, you always cherish those kids who clean up after themselves when they come over for those sleepovers because it's less work for you. Sometimes it's harder to do the cleanup. Sometimes it's harder to fix the mess. And we have inherited a mess that we're in the process of trying to clean up. So with that, I would like to turn it over to Tom. So a little bit about Tom that you may not know. So I'll do my best to make sure I get this accurately. Once upon a time. <laughs> no, um, Tom. Tom is a retired Air Force General. I think I've got that right. You can correct me if I'm wrong. He also retired from Lockheed Martin as the program manager for the Type 4 um, launch vehicle. So Tom is uniquely qualified to talk to you about risks, risk mitigation, what's an acceptable risk and what's not an acceptable risk. Because as you'll see tonight, the risk of this fire escaping was deemed to be moderate is a fairly high risk, at least in the world that Tom and I both work in. So <coughs> think about that as, as he goes through this presentation. Think about the mess that we've inherited and who should be cleaning up that mess, not so much to make it safe, but to go a step further to try to return it as best you can back to its original state. Um, if you'd like to support us, we have petitions in the back that you can sign. I think uh, Linda actually has letters that you can sign. And um, I think petitions may be being passed around right now. So if you'd like to support us, please, um, please sign those petitions and letters. Now, Tom Scanlon.
So, Bruce, if we can go ahead and, and start. While Bruce is bringing up the presentation, one other thing I'd like to, to uh, point out is this presentation is not mine. It was done by a lot of people who have a lot of experience in the mountains. Uh, first, we have Roy Johnson. Roy, if you, uh, yeah. Roy is a Denver firefighter, and he also volunteers to fight the wildfires up here. He knows about what he speaks. Uh, Andy Hoover uh, participated with us putting the, putting the pitch together, and, and Andy is a homeowner who lost his home. Andy's been a uh, mining engineer, and, uh, and, uh, and he's also the grandson of the Perfect. Beth is, has been the strength of our entire team. Beth, uh, Beth is a land development. <laughs> but, but Beth has also had been a paralegal previously. And as such, Beth knew where to go to get all of the information. What we're going to show you tonight is all based on fact. It was extracted from publicly available documents. And Beth is the one who figured out how to get them uh, released. And, and finally, we have uh, Scott Apple. Scott lost his life in the fire. He has been a, a staunch supporter of everything that we've done on the mountain. Scott is a, uh, a forestry equipment. Uh, uh, he sells forestry equipment and, uh, and has taken care of most of the folks on our mountain. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is, this team that has gone through all this has the background. My, my background, as, uh, as uh, Sam pointed out, I, the one thing that I did that was significant to this is I have done at least four major investigations of failures of rockets and satellites. Uh, so I know the kinds of things that need to be done to do the investigation and also to fix it afterwards. So Bruce, go ahead. This was prepared for you. And I guess I'd like to Oh my gosh, yes. uh, I can't do both. I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to point out one other thing. Uh, Sam kind of pointed out that, you know, this is, this is our story. Actually, in my mind, this is your story. And the whole reason that this group of people has been so uh, uh, focused on trying to make sure we know what really happened is so this never happens to you. Because the things that we've turned up, I think, are going to dismay you, uh, hopefully outrage you, so we can make sure that the legislature and the governor take steps to make sure that this never happens. Uh, as a, a failure investigator, I, I've always found that it's not just one thing that happens. It's usually a bunch of things that happen. Usually any one of which, had they been taken care of correctly, would have prevented the disaster in the first place. Uh, in this case, we're going to talk, oops, I'm sorry. We're going to talk to you specifically about the planning that was done before the fire, uh, about the monitoring that happened after the fire, and we're going to talk about the reaction that occurred as a result of the fire uh, in, in notifying the local residents. I also want to point out one thing on this on this slide. Uh, I happen to know this house. It used to be mine. Um, number one, we've had people talk to us about mitigation. And I'm not going to say mitigation is a bad thing. Every one of us on the mountain spent a lot of time mitigating. I had a, about an acre and a half below my house that was a, a small meadow. Uh, so, and, and as you can see, I constructed the house out of insulated concrete form so it wouldn't burn. We had composite uh, fiberglass shingles, the highest rating that I could get. This fire didn't care about that. My neighbor just up the hill from us had 10 acres with three trees on it, and his house burned to the ground. So it's not a question of mitigation, although mitigation is a critical aspect of what we do in the mountains. Um, I told you that we're going to talk to you about a number of things. We started out with the Bill Bass report that was commissioned by Governor Higginsburg. And although there was a tremendous amount of data in his report, uh, when he talked on television, he basically said, 
The only error was the decision not to monitor on the third day. Uh, the report had much, much more information than that, and we're going to step you through that and all of the other public information that we had. One thing I want to remind you about, this is what you're responsible to do if you ever want to do a prescribed burn. First of all, you have to have approval by a local fire department. You have to have snow on the ground, otherwise you can't start a fire. It should be no bigger, it has to be no bigger than six by six by six. And at the end of the day, well, I'm sorry, after your final approval, before you go do it, at the end of the day, you have to make sure the fire is dead out. Now, at the bottom of each one of these charts, you're going to see a little takeaway. What we tried to do, rather than be uh, tutorial to, to the commission, was try to say, make, uh, I'll call them rhetorical questions. Is, is this what the Forest Service does? And I'll tell you the answer. The answer is no. Uh, and, and the other question is, should it be? And I'll tell you the answer to that. It absolutely should be. So now we're in the planning phase of, of the activity. In, in the Forest Service definition of a high risk, it says there's limited opportunity for containment, and, and if it's a high risk, you're going to need additional resources. This little area, this ridge down here, is where the burn was started. Actually, there are four or five, and I think there's four separate areas that were burn areas, which kind of perplexed us. I'll come back to that. The only road into this area comes off the Foxton Road in this area, comes up and circles around, and there is then a road that goes down this little valley right here. And, uh, and that uh, ended up being the road that they, I believe, that they were going to use as the containment road. There's only one other road, and I've walked this area. It's right back here along Long Gulch. It also comes out. Uh, but if any one were back here, they'd be trapped by these hills on this side and these hills here. This is 2,000 feet up to the top of Kester Road, and the prevailing winds go this way the whole time. So with this kind of topography, which the Forest Service said they couldn't walk on because it was so tiring for the people, uh, the, the question is, why wasn't this a high-risk rating, and why wasn't it critically reviewed to make sure that that was, that was done. And more importantly, why after the burn on day two was there only one person out checking the area, no people on the third day, and only three people in a pickup and an ATV on the, on the day of the wildfire. I showed you, this is where the houses were. However, I need to point out, this is uh, Ridge Road over here. There are a lot more houses here. There's more houses here. One of the requirements of the burn plan was to notify the local residents. I can tell you for a fact, none of these people were notified ahead of time. And, and we were told that there was a small sign down here and a sign down here saying there would be a, a prescribed burn sometime. That was the extent of the notification of the residents in the area. Um, so, so this is from the burn plan. When they assess the risk as moderate risk, which is what they did, they expect moderate damage to vegetation, habitat, and improvements. They also expect no residents to be involved. As I just showed you, the prevailing winds and the steep terrain put these homes all in jeopardy. The ones that are shown are the ones that burn. There are hundreds of more homes right behind it. And I'll also tell you, that on the night of the fire, the only reason more people didn't die is because, fortunately, the wind laid down and the fire laid down along Kester Road and, uh, and didn't progress any further because it would have been impossible, based on our discussions with firefighters, for them to have contained that fire if the winds continued at 70 miles an hour as they were blowing that day. The big question. Is there a culture of risk acceptance? I, I, I will tell you as a guy who launches rockets for a living, I would never launch a rocket where I had a moderate risk to the people in the local area. 
um, that, uh, that could have killed them. And I guess I go a step further. I apologize, I don't need to speak though. Or often. Um, I go a step further. Uh, my wife is a, an emergency nurse. Um, how would you, well, let, let's go a different way. Let's talk about, about um, elective surgery. Uh, how would you like to be the person who has gone into the hospital for elective surgery, which a prescribed fire is, and have the doctor tell you that, uh, you know, we have a little bit of a problem, we're going to take Sunday off, uh, but that shouldn't be a big deal. And, uh, and by the way, the, you know, there's, there's kind of a moderate uh, potential for you to die from this. Did we talk about this beforehand, doctor? Well, no, we didn't, but it's okay, because because we also have another hospital about 10 miles from here, just in case we need blood. We'll be able to call them, and they'll come on over. That's exactly the scenario that you all are facing and that we faced that night. So, I, I told you this was a brief, I think I told you, this was a brief from the Aging Commission. I need to tell you, we have continued on, as Sam said, and, and this is a new fact which we came up with, which Beth came up with just recently. This is a documentation of what happened down in that prescribed burn area before the fire. We thought there was one previous fire. It turns out there were nine previous fires in this area that went across those four areas. And as he said, Dan Beveridge, who wrote the report, these operations, prescribed fires, were conducted to evaluate fire behavior under weather conditions and in masticated and untreated fuels. Now, of those nine fires, five of them had escapes. One of them had an escape where the Forest Service left the, the area Winds reignited the fire, and the North Fork Fire Department had to come in and put it out. The other, the other, the other ones were canceled for weather, and it looks like I, I didn't see anything on the chart. So maybe this one was successful. Out of ten fires, one was successful. They knew of the danger of escapes because of winds, and they went on with this fire driest march in history. Worse than that, another thing that I always do as, as an investigator and as the guy responsible, when we learn something, we go back and we fix it. This is the original burn plan that was, that was put together in 2006. And by the way, there's a lot of good information on that. However, after all those fires and all those escapes and the recognition of the winds, there was no change. I take it back. They changed the date. Uh, and they may have changed some other insignificant things in, in 2011 and just before our fire. But basically the same document. And in fact, many items in it were not done. Excuse me, what does yes. escapes mean? I'm sorry, sir. Thank you. Escapes means... You have, a, you have an area wherein you're hoping to contain the fire, and something happens, like a wind, that blows the fire out into another area. Uh, and, and then it becomes what they call a spot fire. I apologize for the jargon, so please stop me if I, if I use the jargon. One of the words I'm going to use is mastication, which we learned about. I'm going to explain that to you. Does that answer your question, sir? Yes, thank you. Um, so anyway, there should be critical process that when we learn new information, we go back and we update our, uh, and change our planning assumptions, particularly the fact of winds and, uh, and the fuels that were on the ground. So this is the Forest Service definition for a high-risk rate. High fuel loads, and I'm going to talk to you about the high fuel loads that were present down in that area on the next chart. The terrain, I already talked to you about the, the very, very steep terrain and all the little valleys that create variations in fire behavior as a result of microclimates that occur. 
Some people have claimed that this tragedy was a result of freak weather conditions. I'm going to talk to you about known weather conditions before the fire started, but you have already seen that they knew about the erratic winds that occurred down in this area. So, mastication. This whole area, these four burn areas, um, were masticated before. What that means is this great big uh, vehicle, tracked vehicle, uh, I'm sorry, big vehicle, comes in with a, uh, a shredder on the front end. It goes through and it rips down trees like this, sucks them in, and spits out splinters and pieces of wood uh, everywhere from small shards to one by two to two by four is what Dan Belvedere's report said. Not only did it say that, he said they did not measure the depth of the masticated fuels in this area, nor did they measure the dryness of the masticated fuels in the area, and as a result had no idea exactly how this would be done. In fact, as the news was asking one of the uh, forest agents, the, one of the people in charge of the burn, uh, he said, we need to get more information about how fire reacts to masticated fuels. Now I'll tell you, right here is a quote that came out of the Bill Bass report, well known to the Forest Service, well known to the firefighters, and it basically says that when there's masticated fuel, they support the highest rates of spread of fires, the highest fire intensity, and flame lengths to, that will uh, cause the greatest mortality of trees. So, we know enough about masticated fuels that we should never have been burning on the driest March in history. And I am sorry I forgot to introduce one other person because I didn't see Jack on. Here he is. Jack was our weatherman. He is a pilot.
risk of weather, excuse me, to a red flag warning, the worst uh, indication that you can have for fire. Another thing the forest, the forest Department knows is that weather has been found to be the immediate causal factor in all of the escapes that they have reviewed in the past. However, with all of this knowledge beforehand, they send one person out and they decide not to monitor the burn site on Monday. Now I'm going to tell you, this picture was taken from the top of Kester Road. We're looking down into a valley about two miles away, I'm guessing. Is that about right? That's not small smokes, in my opinion. In fact, it's, it was not small folks, smokes, in other people's opinion, over in Pine, which is, as you all know, the other side of the mountain over here. And in fact, one of the residents there called up uh, uh, the fire department 911 and said, there's a fire going on over, in, uh, over near the uh, Kester Road area. They were, so as a result of that, 911 dispatched a lower North Fork fire engine to go check it out. However, the, uh, the fire engine was turned around. The call was canceled by the Colorado State Forest Service because they just had one person out there examining the smokes. This is one of the kinds of things that I was talking about. This isn't a single fault, but had this fire department truck gone, as they have gone in many cases in the past and have taken care of the people in the mountain community, I'm sure they would have put out the smokes. So not only did they call them off at about 2 p.m. on Saturday, there was nobody out on this fire through that day that was going to be 45 mile an hour gusts. And, and, uh, and it was nearly two days before anyone returned. And when they returned, they came back not with a fire engine, they came back with a pickup, three guys, and, uh, and a 70-gallon tank, which they had to fill at the stream uh, that runs down through Fo next to Foston Road. <coughs> um, this is the kind of thing that they were facing on an ATV. And this is not what happened that day. We've got to have truth in advertising. It's a picture we found. But this is what the guys were facing when they were going there to mop up. This was the day that the day before had been identified as a red flag warning day. So what happened as a result of this? After the fire started, after the three guys that were there could not contain it, and it escaped over the ridge. By the way, it escaped over exactly the same ridge that it had escaped by the previous year in the fires that we were talking about? Exactly the same place. Um, Chief Kurt Rogers finally was, had been called uh, and got there at about 2.30. He identified the need at that time uh, to identify trigger points where if the fire had gone any further, we had to, we had to call it an escape and bring in more resources. He said in his report that that was imminent, okay? Uh, and, and oh, by the way, one of the other requirements of the burn plan was to identify trigger points. They were not identified in the plan. At 2.39, that fire was declared escape. However, for some reason, we haven't found the answer. It was nearly two and a half late hours later before an evacuation notice was sent to the residents up on the top of Kester Hill with the prevailing wind, red flag warning, 70 mile an hour gusts blowing up that hill. And, uh, and, and we don't know what happened between 2.30 and 4.50, but had an evacuation, evacuation notice gone out at that time, I can guarantee you we would not have lost three lives. More importantly, it was, it, the evacuation notice was even more critical because I, I, I'm sure many of you saw on the news the uh, pictures that Doug, what's Doug Zillard, uh, had taken driving through the flames that were up on Kester Road. 
Had one of those trees blown down in the 70 mile an hour pest, there were dozens of more people at the end of the road who would have died because they couldn't get out of that area. At 502, as a result of the evacuation notice, a reverse 911 call went out. The trouble was, it apparently had never been tested properly, and as a result, many calls went out to places as far away as Winchester, not to the people on the hill. In fact, we only found one person on the hill who has, had gotten one of those evacuation notices. They were going to Morrison, they were going all over the place, but not where the people at risk were. In addition, many of the people on the hill who had been calling in saying, yeah, should we be worried? And being told this is a prescribed burn and if anything changes, we'll call you back. Well, I can tell you for a fact that at 2.34, Ann Apple called in just before the fire was designated as an escape. And if she had had the chance, she would have been out there. Uh, another neighbor was called, or, or had called, and she had called a couple of times because the smoke was huge above our ridge. And, uh, and she got told by one of the 911 operators to quit calling every time she smells smoke. It's a controlled burn. That's the kind of help we had. So, in my mind, the real question is, had this system ever been adequately tested in the first place? We know it's been adequately tested to provide information back to the emergency responders, but I'll tell you, um, uh, Sheriff Mink has made the statement that until the system is fixed, he can't count on that system by itself to even know where he needs to go. So, what caused the tragedy? Was it in fact the fact that they just were not there on, on the third day after the burn? Or was it in fact a little bit of everything, any one of which might have stopped it? No recognition or, or, in fact, ignoring drought and weather conditions. And I will tell you that in the burn plan checklist, the burn boss, the initial boss, and Roy Elming is the name of the holding, the holding officer, uh, signed off on the checklist saying, I'm sorry? To fire them. I apologize? No. Okay. Fire them. Uh, signed off on the check to say that there was no drought or weather conditions of concern. Go ahead and start the fire. There was no change to the burn plan after all of those previous statements and recognition of the erratic winds in the area and, and, uh, and the previous escapes. There was no different changes to what they did down in the area before the burn. There wasn't, this is the part that amazed me, there was no contingency plan for what would happen if we have an escape. The specific words in the plan say, if there is an escape, we will call in the necessary resources to handle the problem. Monitor. CFSF left for you know, almost two days and, uh, and ignored red flag warnings at the burn site. Uh, and, and then finally, the reaction to the whole thing was was uh, was not done correctly. So that's what we presented to the commission. Uh, the commission was established thanks to Sherry Drew and, and Bob Giroux and Bob uh, Gardner, and uh, and the whole purpose of that commission from House Bill 1352 was to set up a forum whereby you, the public, could be heard. And, and be able to participate in what should have been a full investigation, including without limitation, the causes of the wildfire, uh, the impact on the community, and how do we go prevent this from ever happening again, happening to you, our neighbors. And so uh, we went and testified at, that, at every one of those commission hearings. Uh, you've probably seen some of them on the uh, on the news. Could you go ahead and play the video for us? 
tragedy, you guys really investigated this wildfire. I think we have, to the extent that we can, as four legislators. Investigate in the sense that a layperson would consider investigating, no. So I think you all are the laypersons that she's talking about, and I don't know if you understand what I just said, but I suspect you do. I suspect everybody who lives in the mountain does, and I will tell you that they did not call anybody from the Forest Service, they, excuse me, they called one person from the Forest Service who talked about mastery <coughs> fuels only, and they didn't call anybody from the Water Board except one person who talked about how Colorado Springs handles uh, their burn activities. They, the commission also asked us to talk about the financial impacts. Yes. Oh, okay. We'll try it again. Let me know if you can hear it. Raise your hand if you don't hear it. Have you guys really investigated this wildfire? I think we have, to the extent that we can, as four legislators. Investigate in the sense that a layperson would consider investigating, no. Roberts, the chairperson of the uh, committee responsible to do the investigation. The other person was Representative Levy, uh, one of the four people on the commission. So we were asked to talk a little bit about the financial impact to the community, just so they, so we were sure that they looked at that also. We had. Uh, we had appraisers come in, and, and actually Jim Fieldy, who I did introduce, uh, should also have been introduced. Jim did a great job getting the appraisers to come in and talk to us. And they told us that for the houses that were near the burn, just near the burn, that they probably have lost about 15% of the value if they tried to resell it in the near future. For those that had total devastation, you know, we still got land, and we got holes where our houses were. And we've been told that up to 50 to 75 percent of the value of the property in the first place. We also had experts come in from um, uh, forest uh, developing <coughs> agencies to ask, what is it going to cost us to mitigate for erosion, to reseed, and to uh, uh, reforest the area? To it, some extent, we know it can't be done the way it was. And the answer was, if you're on normal drainage, it's about 2,000 to 5,000. If you're on a steep slope, which kind of showed you what most of the land looks like, and you all know what it's like in your properties, uh, it's about 7 to 12,000. And tree removal costs, I know for a fact this 130 is right, because that's what I paid to have 100 trees removed from my land so I could get the demolition people to come in and, and start knocking down my, my walls. Um, this is what the Forest Service told us, about $2,000 to $3,000 an acre to go in and cut down the trees and remove them from the properties. If I use not the high end of this, if I use the low end, so we took $6,000 and we took $2,000, and just that amount is $16 million as the impact above and beyond uh, insurance. And let me tell you about insurance for a second because what we found out is it impacts all of you. As a result of this fire, we've had several neighbors who have been told that they cannot, they will not be insured, at least by the company that they were with, uh, unless they clear, they mitigate the area around their house 250 feet. So, so there's going to be another big bill coming. I don't know that it's going to be 250 feet, but all of our neighbors in the mountain facing that kind of impact as a result of this fire. So, the commission results, let me talk to you about them. They, they recommended four bills to go forward. The first one was a good bill. Uh, it, it extends the financial incentive to mitigate around your property. Uh, what that means is you get a tax deduction of 25, up to $2,500 uh, a year and, uh, and, uh, and that will be extended for five years. 
So if you've been out cutting down trees like we have, you ought to, you ought to look into that. Uh, but by the way, that had nothing to do with the Lower North Fork Fire. Uh, they also passed a bill, or excuse me, recommended a bill to the legislature to for mobilization and reimbursement. What that means is when there's a fire and they have to call in other other fire fighting forces uh, or other assets from other states or from other communities, uh, this is how they reimburse them and how they have the authority to go do that. Uh, the people that responded did an excellent job of responding. It was too late because the fire was already out of control, but this is not a result of the Lower North Fork Fire and quote the investigation that was done. They also voted to increase the Colorado Immunity Act. I don't know if you all understand what that means, but right now the state has a top limit of $600,000 per event, this fire being an event. I just showed you ours is $16 million above and beyond insurance, and the insurance companies are going out suing the state also. Um, $600,000 for the state's liability for having started this fire. And, oh, by the way, it's only $150,000 per individual. I don't know how you, how you value the lives that were lost in this. It's tragic. Uh, anyway, so what they recommended is uh, that the $600,000 be increased to $1.2 million and that the $150,000 cap be raised. And when Representative Levy was asked how did she come up with that number, she says, well, I just thought it needed to be raised. Have you got a better number? I'm, I'm a little incensed. So, oh, it, I'm sorry, the paper that, thank you, Sherry. Sherry just pointed out that that bill was killed, uh, so hopefully something different will the other bill that was, uh, that in fact was uh, included, is called the Colorado Prescribed Burden. And I'm, I've just got to read you a couple of comments that came out of it, and because of my old eyes, the, I, I'm sorry, but yes, Beth just pointed out, these proposed pieces of legislation go to the legislature in January when they reconvene. And so there's still a chance to make a difference and make sure that your legislators and the governor know your feelings about what you want to have done. And this is the way to make it happen. So, so I'm going to read you from the uh, bill. Uh, it says, therefore, prescribed burning is a resource protection and land management tool that benefits the safety of the public, Colorado's forest-related resources, the environment, and the economy of the state. The General Assembly further declares that as Colorado's population continues to grow, liability concerns and smoke nuisance complaints cause prescribed burn practitioners to limit their prescribed burn activities thus reducing the aforementioned benefits to the state and its citizens. Public misunderstanding of the benefits that prescribed burning provides to the ecological and economic welfare of the state exerts unusual pressures that discourage the use of valuable forest research management tool. That's, I guess that's us lay people that don't understand. But let me point out that one of the things that we suggested that I still think, and maybe you all do too, would be extremely important to us is using those resources that they were talking about, and instead of burning them up, harvesting them so that they can be used for other means. In Europe, there are stoves, boilers that people have in their houses that use chip wood. They use a, a ton of chip wood, you know, four or five of my trees would have provided that. And, uh, and they burn it through the entire winter using a boiler that's attached to them. Uh, why, why isn't the state encouraging industry to come in 
and use those incredibly useful resources instead of burning them down. So the other thing I'd like to point out that comes up in this bill, uh, there is one thing that did come out of this, actually there are two things that did come out of, out of our burn. Number one, on September, on, on and after September 1, 2013, prescribed fires must be attended by a person certified by the division pursuant to this da, 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 da. So the bottom line is, they said, from now on, if you're going to have a prescribed burn, you're going to have to have a certified burn boss. Our burn boss was a trainee. The burn boss for the real fire was all up at White Ranch, starting other fires the day that our fire um, and, and let me ask you one question as this legislation goes forward. Are you willing to have a trainee on the prescribed burn next to your house for the next year because they don't require a certified burn boss until September of 2013? I don't, I don't understand how this can be well considered in my mind. And I need to tell you one other thing. I've read the whole act. There are 19 pages of this act. Three, uh, let's see, there are, there are 13 pages of introduction and definitions, and the rest of those, thir those 13 pages talk about how do you reimburse each other for, for people coming in to support the burn, for people that uh, uh, have paid, or for people we call in. This is a big business. This isn't just prescribed burns. So, so the, of the six pages that are left, one was the uh, definition of a requirement for a certified person. Uh, the other one was, it says specifically, we encourage, and this is the only place in the entire bill, it says we encourage the evaluation of other means of mitigating the fires. Not that you have to go to what we found out in our review is that the cost of going in and cutting down the trees with big machinery is about twice the cost. And Beth, I don't remember the cost of this burn. $78,000. So instead of $150,000 with no risk to the local community, we're going to spend at least $16 million if they, if they help us with the land, six and a half million dollars was spent in suppression, and the governor's attorney general estimated that the notices of claim exceed twenty million dollars. We're talking about fifty to sixty million dollars instead of one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, with no risk to the population. And I'm not saying there's no place for prescribed burns, but I am saying. We should assure that, that they are looking at all of the options. And finally, the thing that disturbed me most is they are, this bill requires at least one person who must be either certified uh, by the state of Colorado or by the national level to be present on site during the conduct of the prescribed burden or until the fire is adequately confined and to reasonably prevent the escape of the fire from the area intended to be burned. I think that's what they decided was our fire, that we were reasonably happy until, of course, the red flag day. There is an or on it, and the or says, until the prescribed burn is completed and all fire is declared out, which should be the only stipulation in this thing, like it is for each of you if you ever do a prescriber. I'm sorry, I, I'm getting a little emotional. I apologize. Okay, next. I know. Um, yes, sir. Do we know who was the author of the Who was the author? Because it sounds like the testimony that, um, oh gosh, I want to say three other guys came to testify. Uh, the guy who 
saying, well, her prescribed herbs are good. So it's like one of those ones here in the um, the, the bill was basically developed through the Department of Public Safety and the State Forest Service. With contract control? Well, no. It, it was just a, a government. And, and we had draftsmen, legislative, um, the legislative draftsmen are basically attorneys that work for the state. They write the bill with the input of the people. The, the, what you need to remember about all of this is all of these bills that are going forward can be amended. And Tom and I are already talking about, if I were to go to them right now and suggest changes to them, to the commission, and I'm a member of that commission, what I've found in the past is they have voted me down. Yeah. So, yeah. So what we're, what we're planning on doing is the bills will be introduced, and we'll just amend them. It just sounds funny. Like the party line, <coughs> it's the same day that Robert no. testified. It, Ellen's, it's a like, Repub Ellen's a Republican. Well, I'm, I'm here if it's a Republican or Democrat. Hey, Jack, why don't they go ahead and finish this? Okay. Uh, by the way, I have saved time in the end. Uh, we've got at least a half an hour left that we can take questions, and, and then you can go ahead and do it. <laughs> so, so I, I think I've got three charts here. Let me, let me step through. What we recommended to the commission and that Sherry Drew put forward as an amendment recommendation that was voted down by the other three members of the, of the committee that may have done an investigation. Um, number one, we recommended that there is a required public hearing before any prescribed fire so that residents in the local area can make their, their positions known, their concerns known, and that they can be informed on what's going to happen. Number two, that there has to be mandatory coordination with the local firefighting agencies. I don't know if Chief McCullough is here tonight. I thought, McLaughlin, I'm sorry. Anyway, Chief McLaughlin said that his fire station didn't even get maps of the area, and he had to radio in to get directions to the fire when he was called. There's only two fire stations in the low actually there may be three, the lower north port, uh, Elk Creek, and, uh, and can inner, inner Canyon. But Elk Creek was, is definitely, should have been involved, and there was no planning done with them to establish ways to prevent the fire from spreading through those two roads that I showed you. Uh, we, we said you need to specify specifically criteria that have to be followed and can't be waived uh, by people. For example, drought conditions. That should be a critical aspect that is not waiverable uh, as, as people go forward. And that they should be looking at any changes. They have to be brought up to formal review. We also suggested that there be a formal evaluation, mandatory, for alternative mitigation measures, as opposed to encouraging that to happen. We also recommended that specific mitigation measures be, you remember I told you about our concern that it appears that the Forest Service uh, has a high risk tolerance, that high risk tolerance is your risk tolerance. Um, they, they perform burns with moderate burns. Well, in every investigation that I've ever done, whenever there was a mandatory risk, oh, excuse me, whenever there was a moderate risk or a high risk, we had to explain how we mitigated that risk and, and we're going to prevent the potential of that from happening. And that's what should be done by a safe group. And finally, since there were so many things that were, that were done wrong in this, we recommend that there be an independent review by a knowledgeable third party. And there are many of them. There's a, a conservation, wildlife conservation. They do the same types of things. The U.S. Forest Service does the same kinds of things. And, uh, and, and Representative Giroux was, was voted down because this didn't make sense to those people. Oh, yeah. Representative Levy 
kept asking as this bill was being talked about, aren't we putting too much restriction on you, the fire the Forest Service? Thank you for reminding me of that. So what's happened since the wildfire? First of all, House Bill 1352, we've already talked about. The investigation, in my opinion, was disregarded by the commission. We have a little video clip on that too. This was an activity that was sanctioned by the state. It was prescribed by the state. Uh, and there should be some responsibility by the state. It's been seven months since that clip was stated. And, uh, and there's been $1.3 million identified to go help the residents, as I put down to here, to remove burnt trees. And as I pointed out in the presentation, the low end of the estimate is $16 million just to remove trees, not to do all the other work that's required. House Bill 1361 was also designed to give the residents an opportunity to go before a board, not have to go through expensive litigation and hiring of lawyers, and, uh, and to be able to make our claims for restitution from, for what was taken from us. The Attorney General uh, about a month ago, David Blake came to the commission and told the commission we are going to interplead the, uh, the uh, homeowners with the insurance companies. What that means is they're forcing the homeowners into the litigation that the insurance companies had already started and they have basically eliminated what was approved by the legislature in 1361, and I think we have a video on that too, don't we? How soon would this take effect, and how soon could these victims be getting money? Well, it takes effect immediately, right? Upon your signature. Upon my signature, it takes effect. Uh, they prepare, present their uh, claims, their claims to, the, to the claim board. It, it's happening in real time. Real, real time was three months to get our claims in, and seven months, and we still don't have an answer, and now we're being forced into a lawsuit. So, uh, I already talked about the 1.3, and finally, the, the uh, U.S. Forest Service has apparently been directed to do a review of the wildfire since the past report only looked at the prescribed burn portion, and we've asked to be a part of that and have thus far been told, no, uh, we'll, we'll listen to your inputs. So, how can, how can you help? How can you not only help us, but help yourselves? Most, most important, the reason we've gone through this whole presentation, the reason we spent months of our personal time, was to try and protect you, our neighbors, up here on the mountain. And, and you all have been just absolutely great to us. I want to hear it. From the very start, uh, with the Mountain Resource Center, which you all support, Sharon Shaggy is here. Sharon <laughs> Finding a shelter, helping us with clothing. All we had was the clothes we had on our back, in most cases. Uh, um, feeding us, uh, you, you all have been great. There have been people having donation uh, campaigns to uh, to help us as we're going through the mess we're going through, and uh, and and in fact, the most important thing you all have done is the pressure that you put on the legislature and the governor personally through your call, your phone calls and your letters and and those activities. Because as you can see, we're start finally starting to get some traction. Number one, we need you to help us make sure that that bill reflects the things that you all need to protect yourselves in the future. And secondly, we'd really like some help getting the, uh, uh, the emphasis on the restitution that the governor recognized is needed to be done uh, in a more timely fashion. So we have petitions in the back. If you haven't signed them, we'd really appreciate it. We have letters that you can send to your legislatures and, uh, and, and, uh, and 
anything else that you all can think of. And if you have any questions, we'll do our best to try and answer them right now. There's half sheets in the back if you have concerns. If you're making things, if you're thinking about that, yeah. Okay, in the back are, are half sheets um, for you to, to give us some of your concerns. If you have issues in your neighborhood that need to be brought, like these issues, to our government, to our county. Um, we need your input for other things. If these issues are important to you, we'd love to be in correspondence with you to let you know what is happening. And then if you do give us some concerns, we would love to get in touch with you, talk about those, and see what we can find to help you effectuate for things that are a problem for you. One of the things it is, and I'm sure that everyone should know, is every month you pay for a 911 service on your monthly phone bill that you have a phone. That money then goes to Jefferson County, if you're here in Jefferson County, to have the reverse 911 system operate. It's failed, it's broken. It, it failed again on October 4th. You are not necessarily protected like you need to be. Jefferson County has done a few things in the recent two months to try and make it work. They haven't figured it out. It's one of the things that we will continue to bring pressure on is a 911 that is tested, a 911 that we can rely on, that our confidence can return, that if I happen to have a problem, a fire at my home, it's going to be addressed in adequate and correct time. But that can only really happen if we, I think, if we make it happen. Um, the time is now. They are, our, our Jefferson County has nine fire districts that serve Jefferson County. What we need and what I believe is coming is one fire dispatch for all of Jefferson County. We don't have it now. Denver County, if you live in Denver County, there's one fire dispatch. And that protects the entire area. We didn't have trained fire dispatchers on the day of the fire. It's a big problem. The reason these people died, 911 didn't work, reverse 911 didn't work, and the emergency notification that they, um, Jefferson County, um, used for us, it needs to get right, and it's part of this public pressure that you know it doesn't work. They put out a smart 911 on their website that you can go in and provide information about your cell phone. I've tried it, and I can't get it in there. I'm sorry, I'm sorry.
cash. It's a department that's um, handled through our sheriff's department. And uh, we had Tim McSherry, who has since retired from that position. He was a, uh, a, a sheriff's department employee. <coughs> and since the Lower North Fork fire, the sheriff has taken a, a different approach to that position. And it's a very positive approach to that position. I don't know if it's been shared with all of you. And that is looking at coordinating with local fire departments and specifically to the West, um, West Metro Fire Department and to do a combined fire emergency management type of position and program and put that into place. So we have a combined system with them now, utilizing um, their staff, bringing over Clint within emergency management to take over Tim McSherry's position. And it's a, it's a, it's a higher level, and it's a, it's a more focused type of emergency management type of process um, that's in place. Um, one thing that I want to mention as far as the 911, it was mentioned as Jefferson County. Yeah, but we have to consider we have a 911 board that's made up of uh, numerous individuals throughout. So when we come to, you know, is it the Jefferson County Commissioner's responsibility or part of, you know, controlling of, of, of the 911 services? We have a department specifically for that. No, that's why that commission, that board was put together um, to do the 911 process and the service. They have coordinated extensively with the Sheriff's Department and the Sheriff's Department has coordinated extensively with them. Are there issues that need to be resolved? Yes. You brought them up. Um, will there be other items out there that will be discovered along the way? I sure hope not, but there probably will be. And um, there's there's many steps that we need to be taken forward. We as the county are actively working to try to remedy those those items that are out there. Working with 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 neighbors, working with how do we handle burnt trees. How are they best disposed of? Um, do we do we look at a, a county type of facility and activity there, whether it's curtain burners? Some people love them, some people hate them. Um, we're getting in with skid steers and working with, as uh, Representative Jarrell will know, when you look at these dollars that have been presented to you, there's always those little caveats. There's always those little conditions or restrictions for the dollars and how they can be used, what can they be used for. Initially, there were there was identifications that Jefferson County received $300,000 to be used for mitigation on properties. That was incorrect. That information, you know, I would go into Kate's office um, uh, every, almost every morning, right, Kate? And I'd go, Kate, I heard it again. And she goes, I know, it's driving me nuts. And we would go back to look at it. It was $195,000 for reimbursement of services um, associated with uh, emergency response and personnel uh, in place. And then looking at how that equipment from additional dollars can be uh, used. Our goal here at the county, and I, I believe Commissioner Griffin would agree with me on this one, and that is the collaborative effort to work together to look at those dollars. It's been brought up the 1.3 million isn't nearly enough. Look at erosion control. But you know, not only just eliminating or, or getting rid of the burnt trees, but look at a little erosion control. I'm a water resource engineer. I'm one of those little geeks that loves that kind of stuff to look at and analyze it. It's very expensive. Look at all the other components that are out there that need to be treated. I know I'm taking up way too much of your time. But there are items that if we work together, not only everyone here in the room, working with the county to be able to leverage our dollars to work with you and to coordinate, it'll be so much better along the way than it is. What I'm just saying is this is a great start. This is a great way to go. Thank you for allowing me to be here. Sir, you have a question? Sir, you have a question. You kind of went straight to our state. I learned from you. Yeah. Because there's no extra cost. However, they do sign the desk prior to the inspection. The sheriff's not going to give up a portion of the 911 tax each day. Now, what 
here showing the current purpose right now is the current purpose that you be responsible to pay them to have a very good rest of the because there's going to be people there and there's computers and all that stuff and all that stuff. And I don't know the answer to your question. I will. I will look into that. I will. I will get the answer to your question and pass that along. Um, and I apologize that I don't know the answer to your question uh, as far as those dollars that go to the 911 commission, and then that commission uses those dollars. Right. One thing I want to say with Chief McLaughlin, um, we've been coordinating with Jefferson County has. One thing when this fire occurred, he did not have updated maps of this area at all. And, the, and, and that's a failure uh, in, in, that, in that instance. And um, it, what we have done since then is coordinated with, with the fire, with, um, with the chief, that have communicated with our um, assessor's office and also with our um, GIS department at the, the, the hard, diligent work of, of Kate Newman and getting all this information. So there are the maps, you know, and it's all free of charge. It was given to them. Um, but it's unfortunate that that information had never been requested previously. And it could have, it could have helped. Right. Is there? Is there? 
get them on board to help you, and in turn, uh, I think this is what we got to handle. Well, we, 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 we'd be more than happy to sit down with you yeah. and tell you everything we've learned and put you on the website too.
find out, Sherry, we'll get it up on the website yeah. and we'll let you know, okay? What, what Roy Johnson just said is that there is no method for that to occur right now. It's something that we need to continue the pressure on the state, uh, on the legislature with the Prescribed Burn Act to make sure that that type of thing happens. Your petition will help with that. Uh, and, and in fact, as you are alluding to, that was one of the breakdowns with this. It was never made public. I have also, I have one more comment based on Paul's comments on the Evergreen Fire uh, burn building is for everybody as in any, any type of agenda like that to find out the facts before you jump on the bandwagon. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, in fact, in this case, we spent a lot of time to make sure we gave you facts, not opinion. Any other questions? If not, we have one last thing that I was <laughs> oh, no, um, I wanted everybody to know, as far as prescribed fire code, on the day of the fire, March 26th, Bill McLaughlin got it changed so that your local fire chief has the final say of whether or not that day the prescribed fire can occur. Because both Kurt Rogers, the chief from, from Northbrook Fire, and Bill McLaughlin, Fire would never have let that fire occur if that if that part of the regulation was in there prior to this fire. That, so know that wherever that the was one fire, of, that was one of the recommendations that we made to the legislation that was turned down by three of the committee members. So I don't know how long it will last. It was already made that day. The change in the statute, and I have it because it got changed that day. That will a, a statute has to be voted on. That's my only concern. It is, it is a change. It is a change that your local fire department can and say. That's the no right thing to do. Right. So, so one more time, let me introduce uh, Bruce Ellis, the guy who runs our website and has kept everything together for us on this to explain to you how you can website quite a bit, but we're also in several other critical places on social media. We would love to have you guys join in the conversation and share what you've learned. So I want to, we've got a pen, a pen and paper, and you've heard some of these sites, I'm going to give you what is out there now, particularly the students that are asking the questions. You guys know how this stuff works, and you guys know how to make this good work. Okay? So the website, once again, is lnff.info. There are links on that website to our Twitter account, which I'll share in just a second, to our Facebook account. And let me give you the Facebook group for the Lower North Fork Fire. It is called Lower North Fork Fire Information. Join it, like it, share it. Our Twitter account is lnffinfo. Okay? So please join in. It's starting to get some good traction out there, and hopefully after tonight, it won't be a secret anymore. Thank you. Thank you all. One more time. I can't remember if I can say how lnff.info. lnff.info. Facebook, Lower North Fork Fire Information. Just search for it. And then Twitter is LNFF Info, that's all jam. Thank you very much. We appreciate it.